Welcome back to Title Gardens. This video is on the top five, one, two, three, four, five, mistakes that people make when doing aquarium plumbing. I should just call this my pet peeves list. Number one, plumbing, it's not about just gluing everything together, okay? It's about the ability to take it all apart. And there's a very good reason as to why that's so important. It's because things in this hobby, nothing has any real permanence. As soon as you put something into a saltwater aquarium that's device related, let's say, it is already in some process of either breaking down or it's going to get gummed up somehow and you do have to perform maintenance on this stuff. And if your plumbing does not allow for any of this to come apart, you won't be able to service any of it. So just take, for example, your return pump. If you just hard plumb that thing and it has no way of coming back out, I mean, your only real alternative is to then cut it out, maybe? It's not exactly a great idea. So my suggestion there is to use unions. Unions are your friend. You really can't use too many of them, except that unions have, uh, it's possible that they might leak. So I guess there is a way that you could use too many unions, but in general, it's better to err on the side of too many uh, places where you can disconnect plumbing than too few. Okay, number two dovetails nicely into what we just talked about in the first problem. And that is that these things do require maintenance, right? Talked about the, the, the concept of that, that pump failing, you need to take that pump out, replace it with another one. You want that to be an easy, straightforward process as much as possible. A lot of plumbing, it's out of sight, out of mind. And we can kind of just neglect it because, hey, the system's working fine. Until it's not, yeah. So I'll give you a perfect example. In one of my systems, I have one tank that's plumbed straight in to another tank. And the idea is that whatever goes on here, eventually it'll just like passively flow through to a maintenance system that has like protein skimmers and whatever else going on. It's fine, okay? And over time, I noticed that, you know, this tank over here, it's almost ready to overflow. And, you know, we have a, a valve to control the flow between the two tanks, and it's like the valve is completely open. Why isn't the water going through? Is it clogged somehow? And sure enough, that over the years, there's these things called vermitted snails. I'm sure many of you are aware of how lovely these critters are. But they basically have completely filled this valve to the point where I had to take like a wooden stick and just <laughs> chunk it all through and to finally allow the water flow to go through. So long story short, just because things are working fairly well right now, you might notice Things change over time, and essentially it is a maintenance issue. So in addition to having everything come apart nicely, you actually have to go through with cleaning it. And uh, a tip for that, vinegar works very, very nicely because a lot of the, the critters that kind of grow and block up uh, plumbing, even, even inside the pipes themselves, a lot of critters can grow in there. Um, they're all calcium carbonate based, troublesome ones are anyway and vinegar does a really, really good job just dissolving it all. So I try to give your pumps and even some of your uh, your valves and major plumbing parts uh, a vinegar bath every at least once a year. Is that too much to ask? Number three, it's not necessarily like a maintenance issue or anything like that, but it's kind of a design issue. And that is completely underestimating the need for drainage capacity. Now, so this really applies for the folks that have sumps and they have some sort of overflow system that takes the water from the main display down into a sump. And you can check out our other video on sumps if you want to, to kind of learn a little bit more about that or if you haven't seen it before. It's, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with that video. So anyway, capacity. Oftentimes, and I see this more often than I would like, but somebody has a pump with a one inch output and then they, so they plumb all of their, uh, their lines with one inch. But their drain is also one inch. Now guys, do you see a problem with that? A passive drain only has so much capacity. And 
that pump that's pumping water through that one inch pipe, uh, that could greatly exceed the capacity of that drain. So when in doubt, go pretty much as large as you can. I mean, usually the biggest drains I typically see are about one and a half inches. On a couple of our custom tanks, we went with two inch and it's total overkill because one inch versus two inch is not double the flow rate. It's because, you know, it's fluid dynamics guys, engineers, set people straight on that. It's like a lot more. Two inches is way more than one inch when it comes to, to drainage capacity. So if you're gonna uh, err on any side, definitely go with the biggest capacity you can in the event that, you know, maybe even something gets clogged. Like you can, you can totally have a, let's say a, a one and a half inch drain, just again, accumulate stuff. Maybe like a piece of nori gets stuck on too much of the, of the overflow and it starts uh, creating blockages, any number of things. A snail gets in there, that's happened before guys. So do not underestimate the need for very high drainage capacity if you're gonna use a sump. Number four, another design problem. A lot of people, they, they kind of plug everything in, everything works great. You know, we, we, we did it guys, we plumbed this thing up, everything comes apart nicely, we, we've maintained it nicely, everything's great. Until you turn the power off, and then what happens? Um, hopefully, you've designed it in such a way that when all the pumps turn off and it starts to back siphon, that the sump down below is appropriately sized for all the water from the display tank or whatever other tanks can go down into the sump without overflowing it. I guess a similar problem that arises is when people have set up their, uh, their return lines and it's too low in the water column. So let's say it's like a couple inches from the bottom of the tank. When the power goes out, it's going to drain all the way down to that point. And then so hopefully you don't have any fish in there just flopping around in like an inch of water. But again, that could also cause an overflow. All that volume is gonna come down into the sump. So either have some sort of siphon break. Sometimes people drill a little hole towards the top. Some people use like, uh, like check valves, either like the toilet flapper kind, or even like a, a wide check valve, which is like a lot, um, it's a lot higher quality and a lot more reliable, but neither of those are really 100%, especially like I said, over time, things kind of can accumulate in plumbing and kind of cause them to fail. So those things typically aren't a fail safe. Oftentimes they just kind of allow a, a small trickle. So they're basically buying you time. And had you designed your, your system properly, you, this is time that you really didn't need to begin with. What you needed to do was make sure that if when the power goes out entirely, it doesn't matter, do not cause a flood, do not drain your tanks. Lastly, number five. This is my ultimate pet peeve. And I have fallen victim to this myself many, many, many times. It is not using the right type of plumbing so when you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, you'll notice the plumbing section, it's fairly large. There's a pretty good selection of a lot of different types of fittings. And believe it or not, once you do a lot of plumbing, you'll realize that all of that stuff out there, it doesn't actually cover everything you need. There's plenty of other um, parts that you'll eventually have to order online, like three-way T's and stuff like that, like, and like a five-way crosses crazy things. My point is, there is a very specific piece of plumbing to do a very specific task. And what sometimes happens at the greenhouse is, um, we need to do a, like a quick little plumbing thing. And so we don't exactly have the, ex the, the perfect piece of plumbing. So we go with what we got handy. Instead of just driving two minutes down the road and getting the correct part, we're gonna make it work with what we got. And that leads to some janky plumbing. And it is horrific sometimes what we ended up using. So don't do what we just did. And think of it this way, when you're starting a new plumbing project, okay? This is like a blank slate. It is an opportunity to do it right. Because plumbing isn't something you're gonna be doing all the time. So when you're gonna do it, do it right. I mean, don't be, don't, um, end up inheriting this, this monstrous, 
I guess, Frankenstein monster of a plumbing project and just having to live with it for like two years. Just do it right from the beginning. It'll serve you way better down the road. Okay guys, so that was my top five plumbing annoyances and mistakes that I see other people make that I've made plenty of times. Did I miss anything? I don't know. But if I did, let me know in the comments below and then we'll we'll talk it out, we'll talk it out. Because there, there's plenty of stuff when it comes to plumbing that I think that people can learn from other, other folks' mistakes over the years. I certainly have made my fair share, but I'm sure there are some other, some other choice gems out there. So again, please leave that in the comments below. That does it from here. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell for the notifications. I will see you guys next video.